Hello uh, and welcome to this new edition of our conversations on China. I'm Irene uh, Gina Reichel and I'm very happy to welcome to today's dialogue Professor Jan Sudong. Uh, he is a, a very well-known authority on international uh, relations political scientist, professor, and dean of the Institute of International Relations at Tsinghua University, and the secretary general of the World Peace Forum. And I had the great honor and privilege to get to know Professor Sutong when I was uh, uh, in China, and also to participate in his very renowned World Peace Forum. Uh, very welcome to you, Professor Yang. Thank you. What we are going to talk uh, about today uh, is uh, your view on, on international relations. And you have done a lot of work on uh, the rise and fall of great powers. And you are emphasizing in particular the role of political leadership in the rise and fall of great powers. And I would like to ask you at the outset of our conversation to elaborate a little bit um, uh, as to what you mean by that. Okay. Well, I think uh, most of people has already noticed that and uh, the United States is the uh, same, but the US uh, has a uh, leadership or softer power and the decline uh, during the Trump administration. And uh, Biden came to power only for uh, less than two months. And now we know today is that America's leadership is uh, gaining momentum. So this case and uh, strongly illustrate the importance of the leadership. And uh, certainly the major powers, especially superpowers leadership, definitely have a large impact on the leadership of the uh, lesser powerful states. So my argument is that the Le leading powers, they, the leadership of leading powers is really very key factor for the shape of the world order. Because the, the weight of the US ha has not changed a lot uh, as a result of the, of the change in administration, but the impact that the country will have, uh, you, see, you see a big change. Now, when we yes. talk about, about great powers today, we think of course of the United States and we think of China, right? And the rise of China uh, has been quite spectacular. Uh, would you like to comment a little bit on that? Okay, uh, I think uh, first China's rise has already introduced a new bipolarity to the world. But uh, this new bipolarity different from the, that one we experienced during the Cold War. And the cold, the cold War bipolarity between US and Soviet Union and the heavily focus on the ideological expansion through a proxy war. But today, the US-China bipolarity heavily focus on technology competition. So you see nowadays uh, the G5, uh, uh, G5 issue becomes a, a core issue uh, between China and the US. And the, conf the conflict around Huawei is, is a good illustration of, of, of that importance of technology and digitalization. Yeah. You, you see less role for ideology in, in the new uh, bipolarity, if I understand your books correctly. Oh yeah, and the, the reason is that we are the move into the age, I call it a digital age. In the digital, digital age, you find that human life can no longer uh, 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 carry it out normally without Wi-Fi. Now, even today, the virtual uh, uh, dialogue and uh, based on the digital technology. And you find that, and a human being spend more time in cyberspace rather than natural space. And the young people, possibly spend more time in nitro, cyberspace than nitro space every day. So what does it mean? And uh, both China and the US have policy makers of these two countries must be concerned how to compete with each other in this different age. Mm. 
but why does that diminish the uh, the the importance of ideology? Okay, the ideology actually, and if either side of China or U.S. want to win the technology competition, they have to obtain technology superiority over the other side. Unfortunately, at the ideological competition or expansion cannot help any sides to improve their technology uh, capability. During the Cold War, they can use the proxy war to enlarge their geographical influence, right? And But today, and uh, geographical influence is based on what? Based on your technology uh, 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 superiority rather than ideological superiority. Mm, yes. And and you 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 contrast the new situation uh, with the with the Cold War situation also with regard to the uh, to wars right to the the likelihood or the 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 the, the, the greater or lesser likelihood of wars and mm -hmm. your findings are that the situation in which we are is uh, chaotic but not likely to lead to to major war. How yes. So uh, I use the term an easy piece to describe uh, the, uh, the current situation is because I think uh, nuclear weapons will prevent China and the US from going to major war because of the fear about the escalation to nuclear war and which may uh, distinguish the human being. And second, proxy war cannot help them to win the game, but cannot win the rivalry. So in that way, they, even the U.S. tried to get the troops out of the Af Afghanistan, tried to get troops out of the Middle East. Now, I think because the technology competition is based on invention rather than going to war. Mm. And invention also uh, requires cooperation, collaboration, innovativity, diversity, isn't it? Well, I think your observation is a very sharp. You, you, you can see that the Biden's administration has already talking about it, to create the technology club, to use this technology club to, uh, to unite the uh, uh, democrat, de uh, democracy countries and to, uh, to, uh, to develop the technology cooperation. So in, for the competition, against the China. So I think in the uh, future, you will see the joint efforts in technology invention will be a very, very important. Mm, yeah. In, in Europe, uh, we, we are of course uh, thinking of uh, the European Union also as a major force for good yes. in yes. international relations. Uh, yeah. Where, where in your scenario does the European Union uh, fit mm. in? I think uh, the current uh, competition between China and the U.S. create an uh, opportunity for Europe, because both China and the U.S. want to win support from Europe. So this gives the Europe a kind of advantage. But meanwhile, Europe also fear about the technology dependence on either China or the United States. So US, uh, EU won't have its own technology invention, its own technology chain production, and its own technology hub. Mm. Yeah, you, you're, you're, speaking, uh, you're speaking about the, the other players on the international scene, uh, with yeah. the exception of US and China, as adopting hedging uh, strategies. Uh, what do you mean by that? Okay, hedging strategy means taking sides between two superpowers and uh, simultaneously, but uh, on different issues. Mm -hmm. For instance, currently the EU take a side with China on trade and uh, investment. On the other hand, take sides with the US on security and the human rights. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I think nowadays uh, most more and more countries and uh, uh, adopted such a kind of uh, a strategy. We call it a hedging strategy. Hedging strategy, yeah. W where is Africa in all of that? Well, African countries have a little room 
to adopt the hedging strategy, but because and the, they need less military support from the United States, but they do need a more economic aid from China. So in that way, they, their hedging strategy is not so obvious, like the Europeans, like the ASEAN countries, and uh, all the Japan and the the countries around China, uh, uh, surround China. The country far from China and the feel the hiding strategy is not that useful to them. Mm. Because they are they, they are they are better off if they uh, uh, if they start an alliance or uh, strengthen an alliance more directly with China. Is is that what you're saying? No, I don't. They don't make any alliance with China mm. because they do not need a security protection yeah. from neither China nor the U.S. Okay. So. In, in regarding the security needs, they do not need help from these two countries. That's why the hygiene strategy is not that useful for them. I understand. I understand. But we, we, we follow, of course, with, with, uh, with a lot of interest, um, China's expansion also into China, in, into Africa and into other areas of the, um, of the world, um, the extension of China's soft power, uh, economic cooperation, uh, many investment projects around uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, which no longer is a geographically defined initiative, but it's really a global initiative. You know? So in that sense, the, the ties between uh, these parts of the world and China seem to be strengthening quite a bit. I personally, I believe China's relationship with the countries in Latin America, Africa, and uh, uh, Middle East will be an uh, improve because uh, there's not because uh, China has a uh, very limited political or security conflicts with them, but mm. economically they can develop a lot of cooperation. Mm. Yeah. Now um, the the pandemic, the the COVID nineteen pandemic that still holds uh, most of the world in a, in a very strong grip. Um, as far as I can see, has already led to a certain degree of re-nationalization of uh, international relations. Uh, many reactions to the pandemic uh, were done by governments on a purely national level. And uh, mm -hmm. even within the European Union, you know, we struggled to maintain some kind of cohesion in, in, the, in the response to the to the virus. So I think your go ahead, please. I think your observation is a very, very uh, uh, valuable because we have to uh, question this uh, phenomenon. Why, when we have uh, this uh, pandemic crisis and uh, international organizations cannot play a crucial role for counter COVID nineteen, but we have to rely on the national government to do this job. So. It obviously it's not because uh, 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 this threat is uh, uh, not a traditional, it's a non-traditional threat. So international uh, organizations can play a crucial role. So here we must uh, concern the importance of the sovereignty is still very, very crucial. So in the future, it's very possibly we will see national government will still play the key role in dealing with the crisis. Mm. We, we have studies though, um, for example, one study that we presented recently at the Bruno Kreisky Forum uh, done for the Shanghai Institutes for International Studies that showed that the national response to the corona crisis is much more expensive than a co coordinated multilateral response would be. So, there, there, there is a lack of logic in the in the response of uh, of many governments. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's true, and uh, you have a, a, a separate and uh, a campaign against uh, COVID nineteen. The cost definitely will be higher than have a, a global uh, plan or the uh, design uh, uh, strategy to dealing with the crisis. But the question, the the, the problem is that. We don't have any organization to have this kind of a power or capability to do the conciliation or uh, uh, further uh, uh, among the countries 
That's why we still have to rely on the national governments to deal with the crisis. Personally, I, uh, I feel and it seems to me, whenever we have a crisis, the go national governments play a role than international organization. But in terms of the non-crisis issues and the international organization may play a better role than the national governments. Mm. So, so in terms of, of developing, for example, global health systems or um, other um, factors that could increase the long-term resilience of the international community, you see a greater role for international organizations than in crisis situations. Well, how much role the international organization can play and also depends on the leadership. Yeah. And uh, all of the international organizations have its leadership. By now, I feel that's my view. And most of the international organizations has a very weak leadership. Mm. So before they have a strong leadership, international organization can hardly to improve their role in the uh, global governance. Mm. One element that you are using in your in your series also to describe uh, political leadership is is that of moral leadership, and and yes. that is 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 um, is a is a is a very complex issue and can be understood yes. <laughs> by many by many people differently. Would you would you elaborate a little bit on okay. on how how you see it? Okay. Human, so, uh, human beings of morality can be divided as three levels, at the individual level, at the state level, and at the world level. So at the individual's level, like the loyalty to a uh, uh, spouse, that has nothing to do with uh, their responsibility for the country, right? So yeah. at the state level and the morality judged by how much the policymakers are responsible for the interests of the whole people of the nation. And but for the leadership of international organizations, that depends on how responsible and capable to protect the interests of human being. So you see, at the three different levels, morality will be judged by different uh, criteria or standards. So I'm talking about the uh, moral leadership at the national level. Mm -hmm. So that means the government should be first responsible to their own people's interests. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, they concern how to make their own people's interests in consistency with the, the um, uh, uh, with the uh, the interests of the whole world. Mm. Uh, yes. So so of course uh, some of that uh, you know was was captured also when when trump uh, said you know america first or when 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 um, the, the president of, of brazil the country in which i'm i'm currently uh, serving uh, when when uh, he had as the slogan uh, brazil uh, antes de todo dios uh, antes de todos so, so Putting, putting your own country first is an element of this moral authority, but uh, how is it um, executed in, in the concrete? Because um, clearly in your books, you criticize the Trump administration quite strongly. And I think many people uh, in Europe and in other parts of the world will resonate with your criticism. Okay, um, okay. I think this uh, uh, a Trump, the case of the Trump and the Biden are very good and uh, useful to illustrate my arguments. Mm. And uh, when Trump yeah. talking about the American first, but then even American people blame about him. Mm. They do think Trump is responsible for Americans' interests in the pandemic crisis. And when Biden came to power, people feel Biden is more responsible to the people's health uh, 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 interests in terms of counter uh, COVID-19 than Trump. So that's why I argue, if you want to have a moral uh, international leadership and that leadership must be moral and responsible to their own people first. Mm -hmm. If a government even do not responsible for his own people, 
you cannot expect that government responsible for the uh, rest of the world. So in China, we have a saying, if you cannot clean your own room and uh, people never expect that you clean the yard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a very good, it's a very good, uh, very good thing. Yeah, very good thing. Yeah. It makes the point very, very distinctly. Um, the the one of the one of the phenomenons that I observed when I was in uh, in China when I when I was the Austrian ambassador in China for five and a half years, uh, you know, was the the very strong support that the population people that I met, Chinese people that I met, uh, expressed uh, for the government policies, which is something that is quite unusual in, in Europe. You know, we tend to criticize our governments a lot. Um, so how is that? Is it because, uh, because it's the polite thing to do, because, you know, no Chinese person wishes to criticize their government? Or is there something that deeply resonates uh, with uh, uh, ordinary Chinese when they talk about their leadership? Well, actually, because we have a different uh, media system. And so in China, and the media cannot uh, do the same thing like the Western media do in their own country. And meanwhile, and uh, from my understanding of the Chinese people, you're, you're talking about the ordinary people, yeah. And uh, in this uh, kind of uh, uh, um, media uh, uh, phenomenon, also the, the people are, are reluctant to criticize the government uh, uh, in public. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say, if you look at the social media, mm -hmm. the critique is very, very strong, and uh, the, the opinion is very diversified. Certainly, mm -hmm. if you only look at the official media, there's not that much critique. But if you go to the uh, social media, and then you find the critic is quite uh, uh, popular. Mm. When when uh, when you look at the at the present situation in China and and the context in which China um, uh, finds itself internationally, wh where would you wh what would you say are the, the the greatest challenges for the Chinese government to practice the kind of moral authority that that you are advocating? In terms of foreign policy, and uh, there's a big obstacle for China to adopt this kind of uh, leadership. The reason is that, and China uh, adhere to non-alignment of principle. Mm. The alignment principle blocked China from taking, uh, from uh, providing security protection for other countries. Mm -hmm. So as long as China cannot provide security for the other countries, and is hardly to dramatically improve the China's uh, uh, international strategic credibility, because people say, hey, you're never responsible for others' security interests. So I think uh, it's a, uh, I think the major obstacle is uh, the non-aligned uh, principle. Mm. So are you arguing for, for China to take a more military role in the future? Oh, non-alignment uh, uh, principle definitely prevent China from uh, uh, taking uh, more uh, military actions in the world. Mm -hmm. Except the world peacing uh, uh, program uh, 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 adopted by UN, I don't think China can do any other uh, uh, military actions for uh, any other country. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you, you see that this um, adhesion to the non-alignment principle will continue? Yeah. Uh, I don't think that the world trend in short term. Mm -hmm. and, and when you look at, at the situation in China domestically, there is obviously also a role for the exercise of this moral authority domestically. What, what, what are the the major challenges for the Chinese government that you see? Okay, domestically problem is that, uh, domestic obstacle is that, now the, uh, the, what are the polarization is uh, too serious. And if you're talking about the responsible for the interests of the people, it means responsible for the interests of the, uh, the whole nation, the majority of the population. But now there's a, 
the polarization and the between the rich and the poor becomes larger and larger. So the the, the poor people and the un, very unhappy with that. So they are looking for government to reduce the uh, the gap between the poor and the uh, the uh, the rich. So it is still it is still the economic betterment, the social progress that is the the, the biggest uh, um, challenge for the for the for the Chinese government and and probably also the the environmental issues in in the country or. Uh, environmental issue is there, but it is not uh, the first, the most important thing. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is a uh, distribution of the wealth. Distribution. You see, for the government, if the responsible government definitely were to improve the production, enlarge the wealth of the nation, right? Mm -hmm. The first uh, responsibility. The second, uh, really, second uh, responsibility closely related to the very first one is what distribution the wealth you you enlarge the the cake you make a big cake but then how can you divide it, the cake for uh, uh, for the uh, uh, customers so nowadays uh, the distribution is a big issue yeah yeah now the, we we have studies that the corona pandemic uh, destroyed the wealth generation for many countries you know, for Brazil, I think 14 years of prosperity have been destroyed already. Um, other part, other countries, you know, significant amounts in Europe, significant uh, amounts of years, seven years for France, etc. So, uh, of course, these are es estimates uh, by, by economists, and we will see how it turns out. China uh, is the one big economy which will actually grow uh, in uh, in 20 which actually grew in 2020 and will continue to grow in in 2021 um so the cake will grow as you say and, oh, yes, yes. and 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 the distribution of the wealth will will hopefully also become more equitable and more more just as a result of the government action but i think um, you're right but it's will... go ahead go please. ahead Okay, producing a bigger cake, and it is certainly a very important for this country, for this nation. But then, during this moment, from my understanding, Chinese government get support from people. It's not because of the production. Mm. It's not because of economic growth. <laughs> it's because of the control of the pandemic. <laughs> mm. uh, provide the health uh, environment for people. Mm. This uh, situation, Closely related to, to people's uh, life. <laughs> so China so. provides security for people, and this is security not for any individual, for the every individual, for the whole nation. So that's the make people feel, oh, this government is responsible for the interests of everyone. Mm. So that's what I'm talking about, the more uh, moral leadership. So because the Chinese government did better in counter uh, pandemic uh, uh, campaign. So people regarded the government as a model. Mm -hmm. And, and of the economic growth. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. And the, and, the, and the government structures in China, which are very centralized, which are very, very yes. effective, you know, they are probably part of what you consider the, the, the effectiveness of a leadership as well. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, I think there's a kind of a, a, a European misunderstanding about the, the achievement made by China in the counter COVID-19 campaign. Actually, a lot of people believe that the achievement is based on, uh, because of our political system. Actually, if you look at the situation in Taiwan, they have a totally different political system from China. And also from mainland China, they still can make a, a, a make a bigger uh, health achievement. From my understanding, main reason is because the government is serious and accept scientific advice mm. to ask people to wear masks. Mm. And for the Chinese people, no matter in the mainland China or in Taiwan, they think uh, take a mask, it take, uh, to wear mask is necessary. Yeah. No one opposed taking a, a, a wearing mask. 
yeah. think that this is a crucial role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's, it's a very- The Chinese government never forced anyone to wear the mask. Yeah. And people are willing to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? Just like in, in Taiwan, people are willing to wear masks. It's yeah. like the, the government that uses the political system to force people to wear the mask. So yeah. wearing mask is a very effective way to yeah. uh, fight the uh, COVID-19. Yeah. And the vaccination also, no, is also uh, widely accepted, right? If 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 we come to the uh, to the closure slowly of our fascinating conversation, uh, can I ask you if 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 you think ahead five years, ten years from now, where do you think the world will be? Well, uh, no matter five years or ten years, I would say the U.S. China dominated uh, bipolarity uh, will become a uh, uh, the reality of our life, we can't, and uh, it won't change. And uh, the competition between China and the U.S. will be carried out peacefully, but will become more and more intensified. Mm -hmm. It was a fascinating conversation. I thank you very much. Okay. I will thank stop. You. I will stop the uh, recording now, and we can still okay. have a moment to to chat after that. So I will stop the recording now. Good.